Uh, first, before I begin, I would like to sort of set the table with what family offices are, because a lot of people aren't familiar with that term. It's kind of an emerging term. Uh, family offices are the organizations uh, by which affluent families manage their business interests and their personal interests. Uh, historically, it's reputed the first family offices were in Europe uh, about 800 years ago. And by associations, there's about 8,000 family offices around the world. Uh, they gained a lot of prominence since 2008, and a lot of the private equity uh, journals and venture capital journals, they've had several articles in the last two years that said family offices are the new venture capital. So family offices have gotten very active in the investment community. But one of the thing is, is, how do you find a family office if you're looking for capital? And what's the difference between family offices? One of those, those questions is, there are single family offices, and we have a single, two, uh, several single family office representatives here, and there's multiple family offices, which a Genrich family office is. Uh, we now have nine families to manage. And so there's difference and differences in interests uh, quite a bit different in alternatives from the traditional venture capital uh, operations. So we're going to begin with each member of the panel giving a, a brief resume on themselves and their organizations. Why don't we just start right with you, Jason? Sure. My name is Jason Reeder. I'm with uh, PBM Capital Group. Uh, the founder, Paul Manning, uh, made his fortune in uh, over-the-counter private label baby formula sold that business you know, a number of years ago and has focused the uh, proceeds on healthcare related opportunities. Traditionally, uh, programs that are close to revenue uh, or have a strategic path to uh, accelerate development. We look at things early stage to late and as well as medical devices, uh, but typically not very large medical indications that require hundreds of millions of dollars of development work. Uh, our office has expertise in background for therapeutics, commercial sales, uh, NVC, uh, but importantly we have personnel willing and open to taking active roles in portfolio companies to assist you know, their legal, technical, or financial needs. Rick? Uh, my name is Rick Jones. I'm with Broadview Ventures. Broadview was set up by the LeDuc family out of France uh, when they sold their business, which uh, was the uniform and linen rentals. Um, without children, they decided to set up a trust uh, that would then focus on uh, helping to improve outcomes in cardiovascular disease. Uh, the trust invests uh, for its own profits and then in, and some of its principal profits are then passed down to, into cardiovascular disease research through a foundation, the Fondation Le Duc, which has funded two million, 200 million plus in academic grants over the last uh, number of years. And also through Broadview Ventures, uh, where I sit in Boston, um, which funds uh, projects that have the potential to be breakthroughs in cardiovascular disease. Um, uh, the, uh, where those projects have made it into companies. Um, we do uh, hope to make uh, a profit uh, on those uh, investments, but uh, we're not a primary profit center for the trust, so that allows us to focus on this philanthropic mission of really making sure that some of these potential breakthrough therapies and cardiovascular disease uh, see the light of day and move on to a milestone where then they can uh, uh, attract regular VC and, and pharma collaboration funds. Amir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Amir Heshmatpour. Um, I run a family office called AFH Holding Advisory. I have a partner, runs a HIC Capital, which is a family office that manages over three and a half billion dollars in Los Angeles, California. Hi, I'm Melissa Kraut. I'm with the family office for the Morton Meyerson family in Dallas, Texas. Uh, the family earned their money in the health software area and have been investing for over 30 years in a variety of sectors. Um, but in the recent past, the last few years, they've gotten an increasing focus on the biotech sector. Uh, I joined them two years ago to head that up. And we invest, we're looking for projects with a very significant clinical impact. Um, and that can be in different therapeutic areas. We're more interested in therapeutics and medical devices or diagnostics, but those um, in the latter categories that do have a significant clinical impact, we'll look at. 
Uh, we tend to invest between half a million and five million in a project, um, and we will either do it by ourselves or with the city. Great. Uh, I'll go back to Jen Rich Family Office, which I'm with. Again, multiple families. Um, the interests, and I think this addresses most of the group, and there will be, a, or there has been another panel, but uh, for families, there are two means by which people invest. Direct investing, which is for appreciation of capital, and perhaps doing something good. Uh, but there is the other one, which I always like Michener's statement about Hawaii. I use it a lot about the missionaries, how they came to do good and did very well indeed as they owned, owned the pineapple industry and everything else. So for many of the affluent families, there's a need for tax optimization. That can be defined in terms of philanthropic giving. And if they have an interest, for example, Genzyme in Boston was raised original capital Cure Tay Sachs uh, was largely family contributions before it became a public company. So there's two sort of two hats to draw from, and some families I'm aware with or work with uh, do both. They'll maybe start it with an investment, and uh, someone talked over here, there's a pour over in terms of philanthropic funding research and that has a tax implication. Now, the big issue for companies looking for family office participation is, how do you find us? And if you find us, how do you find what area there is? Biotech, health tech, medical devices, all of these, that's a big area. You've heard some differences here. And so I'd like to, each of the panel members to address how they would like to be approached, and also what stage they're interested in, and do they do follow-on financing? Okay, so, um Follow-on financing, I'll, I'll start with the, with the last first. Um, we, as I said, we, we invest between half a million and five million per project, and we often do that in various tranches or in various rounds. Uh, we don't formally keep an allocation for subsequent rounds because we like our initial investment to be tranched such that, such that there is a, a value event at the end of it. We're in the position that we, we can do that, but we evaluate each of our investments separately um, as to whether that follow-on investment would still be a good investment when we look at everything else that, that we have in front of us. Um, so our process is a little bit different than uh, the normal. Uh, most of our investments are structured through a special purpose vehicle that's uh, SEC reporting non-trading. These are not your uh, legacy reverse mergers, but as far as our uh, first round, the uh, size really doesn't matter for us. We have a portfolio company here that uh, we did the first round, we did five, we're in talks with them to do another 45 million in them, in an acquisition that they're looking to do. Um, with that said, uh, you know, we, we could take these uh, transactions from, uh, from the time we get involved to the time we IPO these deals. Um, we could be the lead and the only investor in these transactions. So you can find Broadview Ventures on the web, uh, broadviewventures.org. Um, in fact, I think if you search under cardiovascular venture capital, we might be the first thing that pops up on Google. So uh, we are there um, in terms of what we'd like to see. Um, we welcome uh, people uh, sending us information. Uh, the, the primary, uh, I guess, directive I'd give is please remember we are cardiovascular. Um, here at J.P. Morgan, uh, just like everybody else, we've had hundreds of requests for meetings, and at least 50% of them are outside of our mission area. So just remember, it is cardiovascular, although we define that pretty broadly to include peripheral vascular, ischemic stroke, and even cardiovascular risk factors. So, um, you know, we like to see a, a, a brief, non-confidential summary uh, of your um, project. Our sweet spot is from development candidate nomination through first and human trials. So we typically don't invest in a lot of very early design kind of, um, uh, whether that's chemistry or device design. Um, but if you're in that sweet spot, uh, send us a non-confidential summary and um, we'll discuss it by, uh, with our team and, and get back to you. PBM Capital is also on the web. You can search for us and we have a portal for submitting you know, non-confidential proposals, etc. A lot of times I spend my time in meetings like this or talking to academic tech transfer offices or other 
folks who are local entrepreneurs or starting up companies would go to. Uh, we're affiliated with Angel Networks and other uh, capital investment groups that are looking for you know, perhaps a deeper pocket or additional capital sources. And so we're readily approachable. We prefer non-confidential summaries in the beginning, um, but do progress accordingly. Jen Ridge Family Office is, is a little bit different than the last two gentlemen spoke in that we do not like to be approached directly. We like to be introduced <laughs> through either your attorneys or perhaps Life Science Nation or some other third party. Um, and uh, we don't have a particular focus. We're not limited to cardiovascular. Um, we're, we're a generalist investor. However, we have different types of requirements. For, for example, for us to make an investment, we have to have another investor with us. So we don't like to invest solo. We always like there to be another, and that either can be an institutional investor or another family. Uh, we prefer if the other family, uh, if it's another family, it's a family that takes an active role, not a passive role uh, in the companies. So with that being said, uh, we also do follow-on, and we don't like investments typically under a total of $3 million. Uh, split, split between two investors. So what 1.5 is sort of our minimum. We will tranche that so if the initial draw is 500, fine, but we want the terms, dilution papers, and everything else defined in advance um, because we like to take the entrepreneurs out of the fundraising business. So with that being said, uh, I want to address a little further other than uh, those few who have websites and encourage people to come to websites, what are the other ways you encourage people or partners to join, uh, to bring entrepreneurs into your investment portfolio panel? So I, I would, would you know, reiterate some of the points. I think it's a lot about networking. And uh, well, we, like some of the other panelists, you know, will we'll look at materials received from a variety of sources. It certainly helps. It, gives you, you know, the next level of, um, of visibility and, and to be paid attention to if it does come in from a trusted source. Um, we certainly you know, consider our um, service providers as trusted sources, fellow entrepreneurs, certainly folks that we've worked with in the past. Um, we like to work with other co-investors, so um, that's always useful. And we often find folks that um, may have, have uh, met, that may have medical device expertise, for example, they get a therapeutic deal and we share those back and forth, etc. So I think you know, the, more, the more you can tell your story, the more you can find your way to someone who knows someone to make an introduction, the, the more successful you're likely to be. Well, most of our transactions come to us through uh, the, the last deal or the uh, last couple of deals we've done, uh, word of mouth. Um, having said that, I sit on the board of UCLA Anderson um, so we do see a lot of deals that come out of that school. Um, most of our transactions in the last few years have been UCLA Anderson uh, transaction that we've looked at through there. Um, and if uh, people want to reach out to us, they're more than welcome to reach out and directly and get a hold of me and uh, discuss their business opportunity. I, well, I also think it was interesting that you heard uh, two of the panelists mention that they welcome non-confidential summaries. I think that's an important thing to bring up um, because, like I said, I have a foot in each canoe. I'm also with a merchant bank, direct investment, investment bank company. And um, we've had, uh, being in the industry for 40 years, uh, we were, in the old days, we used to sign non-confidentiality agreements or NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, but the venture industry uh, in the early 90s pretty much abandoned signing these agreements. Um, because a bunch of clever entrepreneurs found it was cheaper to sue people for infringement than it was to raise money. So um, we got out of that business. And it's important for entrepreneurs to understand what the investor needs are before approaching the investor is what I'm saying. And I would like to know if the, what the panel recommends in terms of due diligence on them and what you'd like to see entrepreneurs know about you in advance of approaching you? We, 
We definitely like to be approached not just for the checkbook. Uh, we'd like to talk to investors who or who are entrepreneurs who are looking for an investor to understand what we bring to it. We're pretty clear about what we usually bring. Uh, the one thing we also like to understand is the, uh, the entrepreneurs have looked around and thought about who they're going to raise capital from besides us. Uh, we've spoken to entrepreneurs who think about us as, as their only source of potential capital. Uh, two things usually happen from that. One, as, as investors, we recognize that, and usually the terms are not as favorable to the entrepreneur, uh, just, just being honest. And number two, uh, we also recognize what our terms and time horizon will be. Because we're a family office, we don't have you know, a lot of LPs. We don't have time pressure for funds that have a time horizon. So we can be as patient or aggressive as necessary for the investment. And I think that's important to understand as you're approaching family offices because there are significant distinctions from the VC. I'd like to go back to the, the, so the NDA comment. A mistake that, I, that some companies approaching us have made is insisting upon getting to an NDA you know, very early in the process. And until we get to a point that we you know, desire to put some serious time into the investment when we're really hooked and we look at those last pieces of data, um, then that's really counterproductive. So you know, my advice is share freely, show that you want to be a transparent partner. Um, you know, and you, to some extent, there has to be a mutual trust that it's not an argument you know, to to use that information in a, in a negative way, but we have to know that, there, that we're likely to get to some sort of a, a transaction or term sheet before we can restrict ourselves um, to a confidentiality agreement. Other side that I would just sort of admonish the audience, uh, those people who haven't worked with family offices, that it's not a lot different in some respects than venture capital in terms of the expectations. Um, as Melissa said, trust is important on both sides. And I always encourage entrepreneurs to do as much due diligence on us as we will do on you. And there's lots of ways of getting that information. Some of us have on their websites uh, deals we've invested in. Well, why not call the, the executives of those companies, interview them, take them to lunch or, or something, say, how are these guys to work with? But I will give any, any entrepreneur that we're considering uh, pretty much open reign to talk to our professionals or past investees and they can do their due diligence. That sort of supplants the need for an NDA because we, we're looking for a long-term trusting relationship and getting involved with, uh, with a bunch of legal bantering over language in NDA is counterproductive. Uh, I don't know what the percentages are for the other groups, but we could, we, if we open the doors, we can look at over 100 deals a month and we're probably only gonna do five or six a year. So if you're, those people who get the checks are rather exclusive bunch. I would say the same thing on deal flow. You know, we could have as many deals as we want to look at. The more prepared the uh, entrepreneur is, the better. If you have a data room or can be prepared with that up front, it facilitates the process and gets you noticed outside the crowd. It's standard seeking of capital. And we have a lot of deals to look at. And certainly being patient, you know, when we respect that we have a lot of deals to look at is important, but understanding that those who are more prepared and have a better understanding of what they're offering, certainly get noticed above the rest of the noise. Well, I've been asked to, to reserve about a half hour for uh, Q&A, so I'm gonna open the floor now and perhaps we'll have some other directions we can take based on the questions. I see a question over here. John, you have opened an intriguing session, say you about six or, I think you said about 6,000 family uh, groups around the world. About 8,000. 8,000. And you asked, the, you challenged, the, the, how do we find them? Uh, I'd love to have a more generalized uh, response as opposed to specific on how, how to find these groups who, who are not public websites. Well, I think uh, the other people may have some inputs on that, but I'd start by saying you, you found one way today um, is coming to events like this and networking. Um, there's other major family office events that are posted uh, there's the Lido Conference, which brings about 400 family offices to Los Angeles every February, March. Uh, there's a number of these around the country. There's another big one in New York every year. Um, also, there's several family office organizations in the United States that have about 2,300 families that are uh, 
participants or members of those or three organizations? I would say uh, increasingly I see a, a desire for the family offices to get to know each other because I do see more of us investing directly and I do think that part of that is just forming relationships you know, among our organizations. I know there was a, a conference at MassBio a few months ago getting family offices together um, to discuss their investing strategies. And so I see more and more of those happening so that when you get an entree perhaps to one family office, you may you know, broaden your network and get an entree to a broader set. I would, I would just add one thing to that. You know, in terms of being practical, if you recognize in your local community the universities or academic centers that are in that area, those folks are definitely plugged into the high net worth individuals in their community whether for philanthropic grants or for helping to new seed companies get capital. And they will usually be able to introduce you or identify at least people in the local community that would be either family offices or high net worth individuals who could help at least from the local area. Additionally, some uh, public or some nonprofits, uh, the high profile nonprofits will uh, publish information on how they were formed by X, Y, or Z family uh, to support uh, development or therapeutics for a disease regime. And again, families that are giving philanthropically often have the interest in direct investing as well. So that's sort of a reverse way of identifying people, but it takes a little effort. And I think if you simply Google family office, uh, you will get an abundance of information. I was on the operating side not that long ago and interested in finding exactly this kind of information and of course the limitation of just your own networking is typically you'll find people who are local or maybe a few that have been uh, that, that they know somewhere at some distance but uh, I, I'd really encourage and this is a I, I haven't been paid to do this I swear but I'd really encourage you to take a look at some of the databases and actually I think the life science or the uh, nation um, database is, is pretty good at at least opening up you know literally hundreds of, of potential contacts and you need to do your homework obviously before you just call those people up cold and it's always a good idea to be referred in as you've heard but um, for the price of a, uh, I, I, I was able to convince our board at that point that the price of a, of a database um, versus flying all over the country, cold calling, or, or trying to, you know, when it, when it comes to actually how much you need to raise, uh, that turns out to be a pretty small price. So. Yeah, I, I would like to add one thing to that as well, is that it's important uh, to narrow down your, your focus as opposed to going willy-nilly off a database and saying, this is family office, they're interested in health, I'm going to approach it. Um, just like uh, Melissa said, families are getting to know one another and work together more as the industry is sort of consolidating and developing more uh, robust sort of group organizations. Uh, it's similar in the venture capital field. Uh, the venture capitalists talk to each other and deals that get overshopped don't get funded because we hear about this person that run around wasted their time. So just like Rick said, if you're not cardiovascular, don't come to him with some, some new diabetes cure. Um, you know, it, it's a greater fool theory just because he writes checks. He doesn't write those checks. Now, family offices exist in all kinds of forms. Um, a lot of them are trusts. Some are, some don't have an organization. They're part the partnerships between the family, and uh, we work somewhat with the Welk family. We know it's Lawrence Welk, so I'm going to name up. And his family is a C Corp, which is really unusual for a family corporation with outside directors. So it was a question over here. Yeah, a, a follow up question to that. There's a number of these organizations that say that they have family offices as members and then they want to charge early stage startups to present at those conferences. So I'm sure there's a number of startups that have been approached by these groups. So I'd love to get your sense of, do you go to those conferences, do you participate in those venues where they charge early stage startups with the opportunity to present to family offices? I'll take first shot at that, in that there's a lot of angel organizations that do the same thing. And so since family offices become a hot term, uh, some of them have 
thrown that in as a, I think, additional marketing uh, item. We participated in a few, but uh, in general, we, I wouldn't recommend that as a, a high volume way of going. I mean, some people get funded out of that. We don't typically participate. It, we don't attend those, and, and you know, I would question. But you have to have to do the cost benefit and ask: Is anybody really getting funded out of this particular conference? Again, maybe the, one of the problems I see with those types of conferences, unless they're very focused in a subject area, you have the problem we presented earlier. Several of us, uh, panelists have mentioned of needing focus on what they do, and a lot of those conferences are fairly generalist. So you might be uh, in an area for which the families there aren't interested. Yeah. I think you have to remember that uh, all those people that are sitting in front of it, if you don't know them, it's like, it's like a cold call. So how much would you pay to you know, make 75 cold calls? The, the, the return is not necessarily that high. So always better to get the introduction than move in that way. Yeah, I, I, will, I would like to go on a little bit of a limb because we didn't discuss this as a panel, but I'm going to give my personal point of view and I'd like to know how the rest of the panel thinks about it. Um, you know, I view an investee coming in as uh, I'm more interested in the management than I am in their, their baby, their product. I'm more interested in what they know about the market and their market readiness and the competition than I am about their product or service. So I expect them to get to know me and I expect to get to know them very well. So I think, Rick, you hinted at the point that it, the most effective way is to establish a relationship with some decision maker in the investment organization. And it's best to do that one-on-one -on -one the first time as opposed to a group group. That's my own point of view, and that's the most effective. Uh, those who get the goods, the check, often start with that relationship. I, I agree with you, John. I think the first and foremost is the management. I would say of, of the deals that we that we closed, the first reaction is, "Wow, that was an unbelievable entrepreneur or scientist that that pitched me." That the technologies can kind of fade a little bit, but you remember the person. Mm -hmm. And what's the logic or rationale behind like only co-investing? Uh, number one is that way. There's just not one party to call on. Some of our families historically had invested solo in deals. And they keep getting hit all times of the day and night, 24-7, oh, you know, we didn't get this done, we just need another 100K, we just need this, we just need that. So a lot of families like to feel if they made a bad deal, they're not the only dumb guy in the, in the deal. <laughs> and we encourage that. Uh, now that families, once they come on to us, they have a different regime, they're not subject to doing their own due diligence. Um, some of our families used to basically go to the club and talk to somebody and they're in a deal and then they come into a deal and that was the due diligence because somebody they trusted were in the deal. That isn't the type of situation I think that's represented in this panel and that is sort of the old days. Um, we're becoming much more systematic. In fact, a lot big whining on Wall Street has been how family officers stealing uh, the bankers from all of the, the top firms now. So, uh, you know, we're hiring professionals. So a family office has been in my fund, two of my funds uh, on the private equity side is a very large Texas family uh, that in 2008 lost two billion of their five billion dollars um, with RIAs. And they hired a friend of mine from Ernst Young to set up a family office. Now they have 140 employees. And they, believe me, they have a process now One, along the lines of the co-investing, as angels and angel clubs have increasingly been filling the gap of early stage investment in life sciences from VCs and are often and are getting more sophisticated with due diligence, do you consider angel clubs, for example, as a as a, an appropriate co-investing partner? So we will usually try and structure the deal that makes sense for us and then open it up you know, to our network of angels or local angels who want to come in under the terms that we've negotiated. You know, oftentimes, unless you're a more sophisticated angel network, the documentation and things aren't quite what we're looking for. So oftentimes, we'll negotiate the deal and allow the entrepreneur, if they want to raise additional capital beyond what we're looking for and don't want to find a formal syndicate, 
to incorporate in a few angels. Um, sometimes, depending on the transaction, to make it easier on management and for us, we'll have an agreement with those angels on you know, some uh, consolidated effort on voting or management, or board representation, things of that nature, to make it efficient for the entrepreneur. It's, it's certainly easier on us, on everyone, if the angels will go under a single LLC. Right, it's difficult if we're making an investment and the cap table has you know, a bunch of $25,000 checks and us. It's just a bit difficult to manage. It's not, not that that would be an absolute no-go, but it can be structured where the angels band together in, in an entity that helps. We, we also um, will coalesce with angels. Um, having said that, uh, we like to see institutional money in the deal. Helps our uh, due diligence, um, helps our uh, um, risk factors, and uh, we look at deals that have a few institutional investors. We look at deals that have uh, grants because all, all those helps us vet these deals out much better than uh, angels. Um, as for Jen Rich, my partners are a little more benign towards angels than I am. Um, I prefer not to have angels in my deal if I can for the reasons, some of the problems they work, we work it out, but I. Uh, it's just another aggravation. Um, so on the other hand, I think there we are seeing a, a group of angels, angel organizations, uh, which I classify as maybe super angels. Uh, they could have a small family office, but they hadn't yet because they didn't know about family offices. Um, so sometimes those people are sort of making the transition and coming in. Well, uh, could you remind me your second question? Now? Trends, are family offices doing yeah. more? The, life the first is that this is a trend, particularly since 2008. Uh, I gave you the example of a family in Texas that lost a large sum of money. They had eight RIA organizations. It was brother and sister running the family office, not professional organization. They thought they were covering the risk. Well, guess what? They found out by 2009 that their eight RIAs were all invested in the same thing. <laughs> so that's why they lost all that money. So after 2008, uh, it, it's still a huge amount will be in liquid investments, which are like stocks and such. Um, but there is a in, huge increase in private equity, and particularly the generous focus is on families that have still have their operating businesses where they made their wealth. Like for example, the wealth family, um, which is in entertainment, real estate, and resorts. So. <clears throat> Uh, I think we will see an increase, and it's still increasing on an annual basis, statistically, the amount that's being put into private equity investing by families. Anyone else have any feeling for that in their own organization or what they've seen in the industry? Um, we think that the, you're right, I think the trend is um, in, in capital markets, you're seeing a lot more of these deals coming out, pre-revenue, early stage. I think uh, there was about 300 IPOs last year in 2014, somewhere around there. About one third of them were biotech, med tech, and out of that, about 80% of them were all pre-revenue. So they're coming into the capital markets, um, bypassing the VCs and raising a lot more capital <coughs> a higher valuation and speeding the process to the clinical trials. Mm -hmm. I just want to get clarified the different different roles in the decision, the investment decision making process in a multi-family office between the, the family the, the family itself and the, the management of the multi-family office? Um, well, I'll start with it being the multi-family office. Uh, we made the decision to jettison out our regulatory concerns because we have another organization that's under FINRA. So we put a a wall, a partition between the two, and what we do is the finding, minding, and grinding of the deal, the recommending to the families that are participating, and uh, we let them make the decision. So, and that, if, unless you have somebody that's a registered investment advisor, uh, that's probably the safe way to go. And it, it really varies per family. Now, one of the, we also are working on it, our families have arranged to, to, to put together uh, next quarter a special fund called the Family Choice Fund, which is effectively a pledge fund. 
and it identifies a number of areas in which the group wants to invest. So we don't really push deals to them. We pull deals based on what the families say they're interested in. Yes, sir. As family offices are going uh, directly into companies, is there a shift in that allocation from being limited partners in venture capital funds, or is it in addition to the uh, the you know, uh, limited partners in the, in the venture capital funds? You know, that's a good question, actually, because um, I'd, I'd be interested in what the other panels have to say. We didn't discuss that in our pre-talk. Uh, in our group of families, there has been a reduction interest in fund investing because they haven't been very pleased with the returns they've gotten over the last 20 years. I, I would, would agree with that, certainly in our case, and what I've heard from another colleague that that, that is one of the motivations. Our principal likes to make the ultimate decision on any investment that his money is going to go into, so is more averse to just sending checks to funds to other people to manage. He's been very successful in doing his own investing for a long time. And so internally what we'll do is we'll see an opportunity, the management team will review it, both from a technical and financial perspective, and we'll have a review and he'll say yes or no. Um, I have brought in deals where we sat down, we had one meeting, he said I'm in and it's done, and then we just work on the financials to things that take longer. So depending on how prepared the opportunity is will depend on how expeditious the decision gets made. Um, what would you say is the biggest benefit for an entrepreneur to go to the family office versus the family office or some other capital source? I, I think it's, it's the evergreen nature of a family office tends to better align with an entrepreneur. So we don't have a fund horizon that we have to get a return in this time period. Um, we're more able to work at what's best for the project. Um, so I find that we're, we're just better aligned in that way. I think uh, we've heard that from a couple of people. Um, I think additionally, if you find some families have a particular disease interest, um, either because of their business holdings or perhaps the family has been afflicted historically with a particular disease, uh, that adds the dimension of not only long-term thinking, uh, but also passion for what you're doing and a tremendous amount of support that you might not get out of a pure financial investor. Anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah, that's certainly the case with Broadview. So we were set up by the family again with this, really it's a philanthropic mission. And um, so we're very focused on helping these companies. I would say we're probably the friendliest investor you could have in that way because uh, we are very committed to seeing the succeed. And I would just say we have pretty maximal deal flexibility. I mean, there really there is no predetermined structure that a deal has to have. You know, we'll often deal with other groups that say we have to have a coupon, we have to have this convertible right, or whatever it happens to be. We'll ask for fund for terms that are typical for VC investing, but we have a lot of flexibility on how to structure the deal, tranche the deal, and add value to the deal. Um, some VCs, I think, will take active participation roles in the group, you know, but our group is very much open to doing that and lending out the resources internally to our key personnel as we help the partnership uh, proceed. What are the potential advantages of VC investors that sometimes companies are able to acquire through the VCs access to certain and expertise or skills that they may not have? Is that something that becomes accessible with uh, family offices? I believe it has. Of course, it's you know, a very varied landscape in family offices. We talk about it like it's a defined term, but there are, you know, like I said, we brought on some family offices that were, well, they're on the way to shirt sleeves, frankly. <laughs> and I think uh, about a year ago, The Economist had an article that said still 85% of family offices will be shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves by the third generation. That's still pretty high. So. I think the, the sort of mantra has been for the last 10, 10 plus years now of trying to professionalize and that's why I mentioned that a lot of firms, both VC and private equity firms and investment banks have been whining about them being raided by family offices. The uh, friend of mine that took over the Texas firm was paying a very handsome amount to leave his firm to join them and uh, so in most of the families that we work with, 
we provide those skills um, because we grow. And our other other vote were a venture capitalist. But I think by and large venture this is not, I'm gonna get myself in trouble with the venture if there's any VCs in here. But, but I'm on the inside. And I can say this, I think by and large, they don't have any more skills than anybody else. So they just talk a good line, but look at the performance. <laughs> So you had mentioned doing doing good if you're doing well or vice versa. I'm not sure. And I think you indicated, Rick, that you know you're willing to put a little flexibility if it really meets your mission. For the most part, are are many family offices willing to put more in social impact versus you know, the traditional VC high high return? If it's commensurate with their philanthropic mission, most um, family offices of size, and I'm saying 50 million and up, have some type of philanthropic mission because they've been advised by their professional advisors they have to get tax optimization. There's lots of ways to accomplish that, but one is with something that they may have a passion and they want to do good. So they, they have defined that and uh, at least for Jen Rich, and that's true with all family offices, but most I think are going this direction. There is a some type of strategic plan put in place that takes all these different activities, investment, divestment activities, and uh, tries to organize them in some cons consistent sort of way rather than just random and haphazard. So, anyone else have that experience? Yeah, I would just clarify what Bobby is trying to do. We, we are organized as a for-profit fund, and we do that uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, we realize that if these companies are going to be successful, eventually they're going to have to raise more capital, and they're going to raise capital from investors that are primarily focused on this being a, a great business and a great profit opportunity. So if we're going to invest, it has to have that potential even though that's not our, maybe our primary focus. Our primary focus is to make sure that these technologies that have the um, potential to be real breakthroughs in, in, in treatment, to real breakthroughs for patient care, at least get to uh, answer the question, um, you know, does it, uh, can it succeed uh, to this milestone or not? So we help them get to that point, but always with the idea that if it does get there, it's got to have the potential to be a high, I think one other thing to add in terms of the defi definition of the family office as a benefit uh, as opposed to the limited partner approach is that we see a lot of families, and I'm speaking more from the Southern California perspective, but families interested in, say, uh, North San Diego County, there's a lot of pharmaceutical executives, still active roles in, in their companies, still have companies. And they have an investment interest uh, that's somewhat of an acquisitive nature. So they're looking for deals that to put a minority investment in to see how they do. But they're looking at that as to, they're looking to acquire. So there you're getting an investor that's possibly your exit. Um, that's one thing to look at. Uh, other cases, uh, some families have offer either manufacturing or distribution uh, in the field you're in. And that's another value add to consider. Now, I don't know if anyone else on the panel talks about value added, but I have heard them mention that it's more than just a check. Anyone like to address that? Yeah. Particularly on the sales and marketing and manufacturing side, we've been known to assist you know, or even run those to help the uh, investor or the entrepreneur in what we're trying to accomplish. So I think we'll, we'll bring that on. And, and we asked earlier, there was a question about distinctions amongst family offices and how do you choose. You know, some have more or less sophistication on the technical areas that you're looking for, and that's one place you should definitely do your diligence to understand what you're getting from that family office and to differentiate the uh, offers you might get. 